Mr. President, thank you. On February 22, 2022, you addressed your country in a nationwide address when the conflict in Ukraine started. And you said that you were acting because you had come to the conclusion that the United States, through NATO, might initiate a, quote, surprise attack on our country. And to American ears, that sounds paranoid. Tell us why you believe the United States might strike Russia out of the blue. How did you conclude that? Well, it was not about that the United States wanted to surprisingly strike Russia. I didn't say so. Is it a talk show or is it a formidable, serious talk that we're having? <laughs> Here's the quote. <laughs> Thank you. It's a formidable, serious talk. It's a, it's a serious talk, okay. You have, uh, you are trained in history, as far as I know. Yes. Mm -hmm. So allow me, I'll allow myself like to spend a minute to give you a reference note, a debriefing, if you don't mind that. <coughs> well, look, our relationship with Ukraine, what was the starting point of the, of the relationship? Where does Ukraine come from? The Russian state became centralized, which was the year of establishment of the Russian state in 862, when, well, there is a city of Novgorod in the northwest of Russia, when they invited Prince Rurik from Scandinavia, from the Vikings, in 862. In 1862, 1,000 years since the establishment of the statehood was marked, and in, uh, there is a memorial dedicated to that in, in Novgorod. In 882, the successor of Rurik, Prince Oleg, who actually was a regent to, to Rurik's young son, came to Kiev, he ousted two brothers that used to be in the past, had been in the past uh, members of the crew of Rurik. And so there, there were two centers of the statehood in Kiev and in Novgorod back then. The next uh, red letter date was 888. The, uh, the conversion into Christianity, when Prince Vladimir accepted Eastern Christianity, the Orthodox faith in Kiev. Since then, the centralized power in, in Russia got entrenched with a single territory, a single economy, one and the same language, and after the baptism of, of uh, Rus, they had the same, the same faith and the rule of Grand Prince, and the centralized Russian state was fledgling. Thanks to different reasons, after the succession to throne practices were introduced by Yaroslav the Wise, after he passed away, there was no direct order of uh, succession from father to the eldest son, but it was uh, it was uh, the horizontal from the demised prince to his brother, and all that led to the partitioning, feudal, parti feudal partitioning of, of ancient Rus. Same happened in Europe, it was a natural process, but those, that partitioned state, Russian state, became and fell prey to the empire established by Genghis Khan and uh, Khan Party came to Rus, pillaged all the cities and different cities like Kiev and others lost their independence by northern, while northern uh, cities of Russia preserved part of their sovereignty. They paid tribute to, to the yoke. And l l later, the centralized Russian state became fledgling in, in northwestern part of Russia, and the southern lands of, of Russia 
were gravitating towards, towards another center, the one of Europe, the Grand Lith Lithuanian dukedom, duchy, the Lithuanian-Russian duchy, as the Russian, the ethnic Russians constituted a major, a big part, and they were orthodox in faith and they spoke the ancient Russian language then, there, but Later, Poland, the Kingdom of Poland and the Grain Duchy of Lithuania were unified and another unification in spiritual sphere was signed and part of the Orthodox priests were now subordinate to the to Pope. So in those lands were transferred to the Polish and Lithuanian state, but for decades the Poles tried to uh, well, convert uh, those those people, those Russians, trying to insert and uh, entrench an idea that those were not specifically and fully Russian, trying to assimilate them. Ukraine means uh, the trim of the nation, the trim of the land, the border area. So. Some of them were, were border guards or something, but there was not about a specific ethnic group. So the Poles tried to assimilate the Russian population there and treated those lands in a tough or cruel even way. All that led to that part of the Russian lands struggle for their rights. They wrote letters to Warsaw claiming that their rights were to be up upheld. I beg your pardon, can you tell us what period, I'm losing track of where in history we are, the, the, the Polish oppression of Ukraine. It was in the 13th century, 13th century, 14th century. 13th, 13th century. And I'll tell you what happened later, and I'll keep track of the, of the dates. In 1654, or a bit earlier, the people who controlled power in, in that part of the Russian lands uh, addressed Warsaw, claiming that some Russian ethnicity and orthodox rulers would be sent to, to, to govern them, and Warsaw declined and rejected that, and then, then they turned to Moscow, so that Moscow would establish its power over them. Just, uh, I'm not inventing things, don't you think? Just, just... What? I'll, I'll give you these documents. Well, I, I, it doesn't sound like you're inventing it. I'm, I'm not sure why it's relevant to what happened two years ago. Well, still, these are copies from uh, the archive with letters from Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the one who controlled uh, that part of the Russian lands that is now called Ukraine, and he wrote to Warsaw claiming that the rights be uh, upheld, and when he was rejected, he re received a refusal, he started writing to the Tsar of Moscow, wishing to, to be part of the Russian lands. And there is a translation in, 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 in Russian and in English, probably. Russia would not accept them straight away because they feared that the war, a war with Poland would be unleashed. 1654, uh, the Zemsky Council decided that this part of the ancient Russian lands be accepted as part of the new Russian land. And the war with Poland began and it lasted for 13 years and afterwards a truce was enacted after the 1654 act. Three, 32 years afterwards, the eternal peace with Poland was established and proclaimed. And all the left bank on, of, Nista, of the Nista River, including Kiev, Dnieper, Dnieper River, uh, was part of Russia, became part of Russia, and the right bank of uh, Dnieper became part of Poland. And in, in 
under the rule of Catherine the Great, Russia returned all those historic lands, historical lands of its. And that all happened and lasted till the revolution. But before World War I, using the ideas of Ukraine ethnicity and origin, the Austrian general staff started promoting the Ukrainian origin and Ukrainian identity, because they, in, in the view of the First World War, they wanted to weaken the prospective enemy. And, you know, the idea that had been born in Poland that those people residing in that territory were not specifically and wholly Russian was later promoted by the Austrian general staff and uh, theorists appeared in the 19th century upholding the independence of Ukraine. They spoke of its need to obtain independence, but all the pillars of the Ukrainian sovereignty, all the proponents said that Ukraine was to have a very good relationship with Russia. They insisted on that. Well, after the revolution of the 1917 happened, Bolsheviks tried to restore the statehood, and the civil war began, including uh, standoff with Poland, a standoff with Poland. In 1921, the peace, with, peace uh, treaty with Poland was proclaimed, and under this treaty, the right bank of Dnieper River once again belonged to Poland. In 1939, after Poland cooperated with Hitler, and they collaborated with Hitler, actually, we have all the documents in the archive, and Hitler pro proposed uh, Poland a peace treaty and a friendship treaty, but he claimed that Poland should give the dance corridor back to dancing corridor back to Germany, and that connected the main part of uh, Germany with East Prussia and Königsberg. And after the First World War, that part of territory was transferred to Poland, and instead of Danzig. The city of Gdansk appeared. It, it was renamed. So Hitler, Hitler asked them to give it uh, amicably. They refused, but still they collaborated with Hitler, and they but together may, may partitioned you, Czechoslovakia. You're a case that that Ukraine, certainly parts of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, is in, in effect Russia has been for hundreds of years. Why wouldn't you just take it when you became president 24 years ago? You have nuclear weapons. They don't. If it's actually your land. Why did you wait so long? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'm coming to that. You know, this debriefing is coming to an end. It might be boring, but it, it explains Mary and many things. how it's relevant. Good, good, good. I, I'm so gratified that you appreciate that. So after, when before the before World War II, Poland did not accept the claims of Hitler, the demands of Hitler, but participated in partitioning of uh, Czechoslovakia, but it did not give the Danzig Corridor to uh, Germany. The Poles played too much, and you know, as a result of that, Hitler started the war with them, against them. On the 1st of September 1939, it was on Poland turned uncompromising, and Hitler had to begin with Poland and the USSR. I, I have read some archives. The USSR behaved in a on, in an honest way. The USSR asked Poland's permission to transit their troops through the Polish soil to to help Czechoslovakia. But the, the then Polish uh, foreign minister said that even if uh, Soviet fly, uh, planes would fly over Poland, they would be downed, he said. But th that doesn't matter. What matters is, the war, is that the war began, and Poland fell prey to the, their own policies against Czechoslovakia. According to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, part of that territory now belongs to Russia, including Western Ukraine. And Russia, that was na then named the USSR, came back to its historical lands. And after the victory in, in uh, the Great Patriotic War, as we call 
World War II, all those territories were enshrined to belong to the USSR, finally and definitively. And uh, actually, Poland, as a, as a compensation, received the originally German Western lands, the eastern part of Germany, part of the eastern part of Germany, some, some segments. These are now western lands of Poland, and uh, it once again received the part of the coastline of the Baltic Sea and the Danzig, once again was renamed to become Gdansk. So this is how the situation, the whole situation happened, and when the USSR was established in, in 1922, the Bolsheviks started establishing the USSR, and they established the Soviet Ukrainian Republic that was not existent before, hadn't existed before. And Stalin insisted that those republics would become autonomous entities. Unfortunately, strangely, Lenin insisted that they should have a right to withdraw and pull out of the uh, USSR. And to unknown reasons, he gave some of, transferred some of the lands to that Soviet Republic of Ukraine that belonged previously to Russia and that became part of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic, including the Black Sea region that was conquered by Catherine the Great and it had no bearing, historical bearing on Ukraine, had no relations. In 1654, when Ukraine was reunified, got reunified with Russia, they were the size of three to four contemporary regions of Ukraine. In 1654. Well, I'm just, I, you obviously have encyclopedic knowledge of this region, but why didn't you make this case for the first 22 years as president that Ukraine wasn't a real country? Yes. The Soviet Ukraine received a great deal of territory that had never belonged, had, had never belonged to it, including the Black Sea region. Russia received those lands as a result as an outcome of the Russian-Turkish wars, and they were called New Russia or Novorossiya, but that doesn't matter. But actually Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, gave Ukraine its own territory, and for decades the Ukrainian Soviet Republic was part of the USSR. And to unknown reasons, the Bolsheviks promoted the Ukrainian culture and language. Ukrainization, Ukrainization was called, and uh, the similar things were done in other Soviet republics. The, the ethnic profiles of those republics were raised and uh, promoted. This is how Soviet Ukraine was created and after the Second World War. Ukraine received part of the lands that belonged to had belonged to Poland before and part of land that had belonged to Hungary and Romania before. So Romania and Hungary were, were deprived of part of their lands and uh, these lands were snatched and given to Ukraine and now they're still part of Ukraine. So in this sense, Ukraine is an artificial state that was established. Hungary has a right to take its land back from Ukraine? and that other nations have a right to go back to their 1654 <coughs> borders? Well, I, I'm not sure whether it can, should come back to the 1654, but if anyone believes, and everyone believes, that the Stalin, Stalin regime rule saw a lot of violations of human rights and a violation of the rights of other nations. In this sense, actually, one can state that they may have a right to claim those lands back. Have you told Viktor Orban that he can have part of Ukraine? 
никогда не говорил. Never. I've never told him. I've never told him. Not 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 a single time. Never. We haven't even had any conversation on on that. But I actually know for sure. Of course, the Hungarians who live over there, they want to get back to their historical land. Moreover, just uh, an interesting anecdote, a personal one I would like to share with you, you know, let me diverge a little bit. Uh, somewhere in the 80s, I think uh, I went on a road trip through the USSR from Leningrad on a car via Kiev, then I went to western Ukraine, I went to the town of Berigovoya, and all the um, names of the cities and towns over there are in Russian, were in Russian, and also in one language I didn't understand, it was Hungarian, it was not Ukrainian. So I went through a village, and there were men sitting uh, next to the uh, houses and they were wearing uh, black uh, suits, uh, three-piece suits and then in cylinder hats and I was wondering whether those were artists and I was told these were Hungarians and I asked what are they doing here and they say this uh, historical land they live here. It was during the Soviet times, the 1980s, and they had managed to preserve the Hungarian language, Hungarian names, national attire, and they felt Hungarian, and they were Hungarian. So, and there's a lot of that, though. I think many nations that are upset about Transylvania as well, as you obviously know. But many nations feel frustrated by the redrawn borders of the wars of the 20th century and wars going back a thousand years, the ones that you mentioned. But the fact is that you didn't make this case in public until two years ago, February. And in the case that you made, which I read today, Just you, you explain at great length that you felt a physical threat from the West in NATO, including potentially a nuclear threat, and that's what got you okay. to move. Is that a fair characterization of what you said? Yeah, well, yes, I understand that uh, probably a long soliloquy does not fit the genre of an interview. So um, I asked whether that was a show or a serious talk, and you said it was a serious talk, so, serious talk, so bear with me, please. So we are coming to the point where the Soviet Ukraine was established. Then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and everything that Ukraine had got as a gift from Russia, well, it took with it. And uh, generally, I'm coming to the current point in time. The the collapse of the Soviet Union was basically the initiative of the Russian leadership. I do not understand what they were thinking back then, but I suspect that there were several elements to uh, their rationale, several reasons. First, I believe that the then Russian leadership thought that the fundamentals, the fundamental basic relations between Russia and Ukraine, such as common language, because 90% back then spoke Russian, familial ties, because, uh, you know, one in three uh, Russians have uh, families or uh, some other ties in Ukraine, common culture, common history, common religion. These are fundamentals, you know, also being in one single state for hundreds of years. These are fundamentals, just as the economic interconnections. And that is what drove the Russian leadership to think that inevitably the relations would be good between the two countries. And secondly, as an American citizen, I want you and your audience to know that. The Russian leadership thought that, okay, the USSR would cease to exist, but there would be no more divisive lines of ideological nature. They also thought that Russia, you know, voluntarily, of its own volition, decided to dissolve the uh, Soviet Union, thinking that the civilized West, as it were, would see that as an invitation to friendship and alliance. That is what Russia was expected, expecting from 
the U.S. and the collective West as a whole. There were some smart people, in particular in uh, Germany, Egon Barth. He was a prominent uh, politician from the Social Democratic Party and in personal talks with the Russian, the Soviet leadership before the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, he was insisting that a new collective security system should be established in Europe. Yes, he thought that help should be given to uh, the reunified Germany, but also it was supposed to create a security system involving uh, the uh, US, Canada, and he said if NATO would expand, then it would be uh, back during, like during the Cold War, but only closer to Russia's border. He was very smart, but no one listened to him. And, you know, we've got some uh, talks from archives, and he got angry. He said, if you don't listen to us, I am not, never uh, setting my foot in Moscow once again. He was very frustrated with the Soviet Union, and his prophecy came true. Yeah, well, it, of course, it did come true, and, I, and you've mentioned this many times. I think it's a fair point, and many in America thought yeah. that relations between <clears throat> Russia and the United States would be fine with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, that the opposite happened. But you've never explained why you think that happened, except to say that the West fears a strong Russia, but we have a strong China the West does not seem very afraid of. Uh, what about Russia do you think convinced policymakers they had to Take it down. The West is afraid of a strong uh, China more than it fears a strong Russia because it's uh, just 150 million people in Russia and it's 1.5 billion people in China and also China's economy is growing at more than 5% a year. So the uh, potential is enormous. You know, Bismarck used to say the most important thing is the potential, and China potentially is the biggest economy in the world in terms of purchasing parity. It's uh, outstripped uh, the U.S. But let's not talk about who is afraid of whom. Let's not talk in such terms. Let's uh, get back to the fact that after 1991, when Russia expected that it would be inducted into the uh, brotherly nation of civilized nations. It didn't happen. Well, uh, you, you tricked us. Well, I'm not uh, talking about you personally. I'm talking about the U.S. We were promised that NATO would not expand eastwards, but there were five waves of expansion. And we bore with that. We tolerated that. We were trying to uh, reason with them because we were saying we, we are like you right now. We are, you know, uh, a capitalist economy. Let's come to terms. Let's find an agreement. You know, let's uh, look at Yeltsin times. There was a moment when, you know, the gray cat crossed our path, as it were. You know, Yeltsin came to uh, the U.S., he spoke in Congress, he uh, said the good words, and these were the signals. These were the signals telling you, let us in. But then, you know, remember the developments in Yugoslavia. Before that, Yeltsin was lavished with praise, but then he raised his voice in support of Serbs. And we couldn't but do that. Yes, I understand there were some complex processes underway, but Russia couldn't help raising its voice in support of Serbia because Serbia is a brotherly nation, also an Orthodox culture. So Yeltsin spoke in favor of Serbia, but what did the U.S. do? In violation of international law and the U.N. Charter, they started bombing Belgrade and the U.S., and it was the U.S. that let the gin out of the bottle. Moreover, when Russia was in Indignant when uh, it was uh, uh, protesting, uh, it was told that the U international law and the UN Charter had become obsolete. Right now, they are all referring to international law, but back then they were said saying that the international law was obsolete. Yes, some things need to be changed, but not in this manner. And then Yeltsin came under heavy criticism. He was accused of uh, alcoholism, of uh, understanding nothing. He understood everything. Okay, I became president in 2000, and I thought, okay, Yugoslavia is a thing of the past. Let's uh, 
give a shot at rebuilding the relations. Let's reopen the door that Russia had tried to go through. Moreover, I said that publicly and I can reiterate, there was a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing uh, president of the U.S., Bill Clinton. Uh, we uh, uh, sat in the room next door and I told him, Bill, what do you think? If uh, Russia uh, asked to be uh, admitted into NATO, do you think it would happen? He said, you know, it's interesting. I think yes. But in the evening, when we had another meeting for dinner, he said, you know, I've talked to my team, no. Not going to happen, not now. So you can ask him. I think uh, he'll watch this interview. I wouldn't have said anything like that if it hadn't happened. Were you sincere? Would you have joined NATO? Well, listen, I asked a question. I said, is it possible? And uh, the answer was no. But if he had said yes, would you have joined NATO? If he had said yes, then the process of rapprochement would have uh, commenced and it might have happened in the end if there were some sincere wish on this side of our partners, but it didn't happen. Okay. What do you think that is? Just to get to motive, I know you're clearly bitter about it, um, I understand, but why do you think the West rebuffed you then? Why the hostility? Why did the end of the Cold War not fix the relationship? What motivates this from your point of view? You said uh, that I feel bitter because of that rebuffal. No, that's not bitterness. I'm just stating the facts because, you know, we're not bride and groom. These are not the terms we've got to use in speaking about such uh, matters. We understood that they were not expecting us there. Okay, we said, let's uh, build relations in another manner. Let's uh, look for common ground elsewhere. Why we got that negative response, you should uh, ask uh, your government. I could only guess it would be too big of a country with its own opinion. Well, I, I saw how NATO solves and settles matters. Just an example I would like to cite, it applies to Ukraine. You know, the U.S. says something and all the uh, rest just uh, tune in and they follow and they're awake. I'm not going to open any secret to you or say anything new, but, you know, after that conversation, we made different attempts at building relations. Just to cite an example, you know, during the events in the Middle East and Iraq, we uh, were building our relations with uh, the U.S. in a very prudent, cautious manner. And uh, I always uh, ask the U.S. not to support separatism in the Northern Caucasus, but they still continued with that financial information support, even military support. And that support was flowing in from the U.S. and from its satellites, uh, support towards uh, terrorist uh, bands and the Northern Caucasus. I once talked to a colleague of mine, a president of the U.S., and I raised that issue, and he said, uh, it's impossible. Uh, he said, do you have proof? And I said, yes, I have proof, and I gave that proof to him. And do you know what his response would be? He said, uh, I would give him uh, a good thrashing. That's what he said. Kick the ass, he said. And we were waiting for some uh, response, uh, reply, and I asked a colleague from FSB, you know, to contact his counterpart in the U.S. And we've got the response, uh, basically, from the CIA and the archives. And uh, the response goes as follows. So, yes, we have worked with the opposition forces in Russia, and we think it is the right thing to do, and we will continue doing that. Just ridiculous. We understood that no serious converse conversation could be uh, forces in opposition to you. So you're saying the CIA is trying to overthrow your government. 
Well, of course, in that particular case, what they meant were the separatists, uh, the terrorists that were fighting us in the northern Caucasus, that is, what, uh, who they called the opposition. That's the second moment. Uh, another one, another aspect, also very important. I'm talking about the uh, setting up of the uh, US ABM system, the very beginning of that. We uh, long tried to persuade them to uh, not to do that. I got an invitation from uh, uh, Bush uh, senior. Uh, he uh, invited me uh, to visit his place on the ocean, and we had a very serious conversation with President Bush, with his team. So I proposed the following. I said, the US, Russia, and Europe should come up with, should set up a joint shared ABM system against the threats against our security. Even though, you know, the uh, official statement of the U.S. was that the, the ABM system they were setting up was against uh, Iran, the threat of Iran. So I suggested, why not join forces together, the U.S., Russia, and Europe? And I got a very interesting response. They asked me, are you serious? Let me ask, what year was this? Well, I, I don't remember. Uh, we can look it up on the Internet when uh, uh, I was in the U.S. at the invitation of Bush Sr. And it's easier to, to learn uh, from someone I'm going to tell you about in a sec. Uh, and uh, they told me, yes, that is a very interesting proposal. And so I, I said, just imagine if we can solve this strategic task together. The world would change. Yes, we would probably have differences, economic differences, political differences, but we would drastically change the situation of the world. And they asked me, are you serious? And I said, yes. They said, we've got, uh, we need some time to think. And I said, okay, go ahead. And then, you know, at this very uh, room where we're talking, uh, we, we got uh, former CIA director Gates and also State Secretary Rice. They sat here uh, opposite from me at this uh, table. Uh, we've, we had defense minister, foreign minister, and the guests said, yes, we, we've thought about that, but we disagree. So and twice you've described U.S. presidents making decisions and then being undercut by their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. Yes, exactly. So yes, they uh, just uh, rebuffed us. I'm not going to reveal all the details because that was a confidential conversation, but our proposal was uh, declined. It's a fact. And I said, uh, OK, listen, but in that case, we will have to uh, come up with a response and we'll have to come up with offensive systems that are able, of, uh, capable of overcoming your ABM systems. And they said, uh, your systems are not against you, you, and we'll assume that yours are not against us. And we had to come up with the hypersonic, uh, uh, hypersonic intercontinental missiles, and we continue to develop this technology, and we are ahead everyone in the world in terms of hypersonic offensive systems and day in day out we are perfecting these systems we proposed that another path should be followed but uh, our proposal was rejected now as for the nato expansion eastwards they promised us that uh, they wouldn't move an inch to the east but it was not enshrined on paper, so there were five waves of expansion. And the Baltic states did join, and Eastern Europe in general, and now I'm uh, uh, coming to the crux of the matter. They came to Ukraine. In 2008, at the Bucharest summit, a statement was made uh, saying that the uh, doors were open to Georgia and Ukraine to join NATO. Now, as far as uh, decisions are made uh, in NATO, Germany, France allegedly were against uh, some other countries, European countries. But, you know, uh, President Bush is a very tough guy. And 
as I was told afterward, uh, uh, I was told that he had exerted pressure on them and they had to acquiesce. So it's like in a kindergarten, you know, where are the guarantees? Who are they? You know, they got under some pressure and they had to agree. Okay, but then they say, Ukraine is never going to change, uh, ch uh, join NATO. And I say, I know that you agreed to uh, open the doors to Ukraine uh, in 2008. Oh, there is no guarantee that you're not going to do the same sometime in the future. So I don't know whom to talk to over there. We are willing to talk, but who to? Whether are getting the guarantees? No guarantees at all. And they started entering the Ukrainian soil. This was the uh, for history about how that territory developed and what relationship they had with Russia. Each second or third person there had has had ties with Russia. So when the elections happened in in the new sovereign, sovereign Ukraine as a result of the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine that said that Ukraine was a neutral state, but all of a sudden in 2008, and NATO doors were open to that. So it's so interesting, but we hadn't agreed to that. We didn't come to terms on that. All presidents that rose to power in Ukraine relied on uh, voters, on the electorate that had a good relationship and a good attitude to Russia. The southeast of Ukraine had always had a good attitude to Russia. And, you know, it was very difficult to dissuade this electorate. And Mr. Yanukovych rose to power afterwards there. He won the election after Kuchma, and the rerun was organized. There was not enshrined in the Ukrainian constitution. This was a coup, actually, a coup d'etat. Just imagine someone in the United States wouldn't like the outcome. No. Prior to that, before, so after President Kuchma retired, Yanukovych won the election, but his opponents did not uh, acknowledge his victory, and the United States approved, backed the opposition, and a rerun was held, which actually was virtually a coup d'etat, and the United States backed that. And uh, as, a, as a result of this rerun, like fancy someone doesn't like the outcome of the American election and the rerun happens that is not enshrined in the American Constitution. So Viktor Yushchenko rose to power in Ukraine. He was a pro-Western politician. Well, anyway, we established some working contacts with him. He came to visit us and we went to Kiev. We uh, had meetings informally also. Well. Let, let them be pro-Western, okay? Let them do what they want. They should have their own domestic developments independently. You know, after he ruled that country, things deteriorated there. And as a result, Yanukovych once again came to power. He may not have been the best president. I'm not sure I would like to give any assessments. But you know, the uh, matter of the association with the EU was brought up. We always were quite loyal on that. OK. But when we read the uh, draft agreement, it turned to be a problem for us because us and Ukraine had a free trade area and open customs borders. And Ukraine had, according to that association agreement, opened their borders to Europe, and that would float our market dutiless and then we said we'll close our borders with Ukraine <coughs> our customs and Yanukovych started doing his reckoning and counting whether Ukraine will lose or or, or gain and he stated to his Ukrainian counter uh, people counterparts that he had to think and destructive opposition activity began straight away and it ended up with uh, Maidan with a coup d'etat in so Ukraine he did more with Russia than with the EU. Ukraine did. Yes, of course, of course. 
It's not about the volumes of trade, the quantities. It's about the cooperation ties that the Ukrainian economy relied upon. And those cooperation ties between enterprises and factories had been there since the Soviet times, like a, an enterprise would produce components for final assembly. Uh, both uh, both plants in Ukraine and uh, Russia, and there was very close cooperation, but a coup d'etat happened afterwards. It was perpetrated, and fortunately, well, I wouldn't like to speak of details, but the, the, the United States said, you, you calm Yanukovych down and it would mollify the opposition. They said, let it drift. They said, towards a political settlement, we said, okay, we are in agreement with that, let it be so, and Yanukovych checked to apply for armed forces or police, while the uh, armed opposition in Kyiv perpetrated a coup d'etat. How can I reckon that and assess that? Who are you, I asked the United With States. With the backing of whom? With the backing of CIA. Definitely, this is an entity that you wanted to become part of. Uh, thanks goodness you were not accepted, although it's a, it's a serious entity. My ex-counterparts I worked in the first office, main directorate of the Soviet intelligence service, and they were our opponents. Well, you know, this is work. Well, technically, they did the right thing. They attained what they wanted, the outcomes they wanted. They changed the power in Ukraine. But politically, it was a blunder, a colossal blunder. And the political leadership probably should have uh, calculated otherwise. And they had, they were to have thought what it would lead to. In 08, they opened doors of, of NATO to Ukraine. In, 2014, a coup d'etat was perpetrated with their help, and this was a coup d'etat, and those who did not recognize this coup d'etat were persecuted, and they had to, they created a threat to Crimea, and we had to take Crimea under our protectorate. They began warfare in Donbass, applying artillery and aviation against civilians in Donbass. We have the footages with uh, fighter jets bombing Donetsk flying over that, and they had a major military operation. They failed and had another one and another one against the backdrop of military development of that territory of NATO and uh, open doors of NATO. So we actually had to express our concerns, otherwise it would it, it would be negligence, criminal negligence on our part. It would have been criminal negligence because the American leadership, political leadership drove us to the borderline that we could not overstep and that would destroy Russia. And we had to uh, support our creed mates, our faith mates. What was the, so but that was eight years before the current conflict started. So what was the trigger <clears throat> for you? What was the moment where you decided you had to do this? Well, the trigger originally, the trigger was the coup d'etat in Ukraine, and representatives of three European nations came then, Germany, Poland, and France, and they, they acted as guarantors of the agreement subscribed between Yanukovych and the opposition, and they put their signatures as guarantors. Despite that, the opposition perpetrated that coup, and these countries pretended they, uh, they were not the guarantors. They were oblivious, and they, they uh, threw it to the dustbin. And I, I'm not sure whether there is any knowledge in the U United States about the guarantors and this agreement between opposition and the Yanukovych government. And instead of a political settlement, they supported the coup, they backed the coup. There was no point in that, actually, believe me, because Yanukovych agreed to everything, and he was ready for early election and he would not had no chance he stood no chance to succeed to win 
Why then perpetrate this coup and all those victims? And why pose a threat to Crimea and a launch an operation against Donbass? I cannot understand that. I cannot fancy this is the miscalculation of theirs. And the CIA did its part, played its part. One of the deputies of uh, Secretaries of State said that they spent around $5 billion on that. But why do that? Why have they done that? It could have been done legally, legitimately, and without the loss of Crimea for them. And we wouldn't stir a finger. We wouldn't have stirred a finger had there not happened the developments, the bloody developments on Maidan. We back then agreed that after the collapse of the USSR, the borders would be as, as, as agreed as stated, but we never agreed to an expansion of NATO or that Ukraine would become part of NATO. We never conceded and accepted that there would be NATO military bases there without any talks with us. We kept begging for decades, don't do this, don't do that. This actually acted as a trigger to the recent development, and with respect to the recent development, the leadership of Ukraine stated they would not abide by the Minsk accords that were signed after the developments of 2014 in Minsk, with a plan laid out for peaceful settlement in Donbass. And the Ukrainian, today's Ukraine, Ukrainian leadership, their foreign minister and other officials and the president said they didn't like a thing about the Minsk package of measures and they would not stick to them. And the former leaders of France and Germany said that around a year ago, uh, said in public worldwide that they had signed that agreement, but they had not been going to execute to fulfill that. You know, they pulled our leg. Was there anyone for you to talk to? Did you call a U.S. President's Secretary of State and say, if you keep militarizing Ukraine with NATO forces, this is going to get, this is going to be a, we're going to act. We kept telling them that. We kept telling them that. We addressed the American leadership and the European leaders, claiming that it be stopped immediately and the Minsk uh, Accords were to be executed. It was our requirement, our demand. I was ready to fulfill, to honor. Uh, this is not a an easy thing for Ukraine with lots of autonomy for Donbass. But I was positive. It was my sincere belief that if we would persuade those people living in Donbass to come back to the Ukrainian statehood, and they had to be persuaded, the wounds would heal, I, I, I was sure, and sooner or later, gradually, that part of Ukrainian territory would fit back into the overall frame of reference of Ukraine and pensions and allowances would be paid once again. But no one wanted that in Ukraine. They wanted to act with the help of military force only. And it ended up with this situation. And they stated in Ukraine they would, we would not fulfill the package of measures. And they started the war back in 2014, and our goal, our aim is to stop this war. We did not begin, we didn't launch it back in 2014. We're now trying to stop that. I mean, have you achieved your aims? No, at this point of time we have not, because one of the goals is the denazification, to denazify Ukraine. I mean, the prohibition of neo-Nazi movements in Ukraine. This is one of the issues that we discussed that was brought up during negotiations in Istanbul last year, at the, at the outset of last year. Uh, upon our initiative, it was concluded, as the Europeans told us, that 
the context had to be established and provided for the final definitive signature of documents. And my colleagues in France and Germany told me, just imagine how can they, how are they going to uh, to sign this at gunpoint? You should move your troops, pull your troops back from Kiev. As soon as we pulled our uh, troops back from uh, the Kyiv region, all of a sudden, straight away, our Ukrainian uh, counterparts, our negotiators, threw all the accords and wasted them uh, into the dustbin, and they got ready for a long-standing standoff and opposition, military opposition, with the help of the United States. This is how things yeah. develop. So, so, but what is, pardon my ignorance, what is denazification? What would that mean? Well, I'm coming to that. It is a very important question, a pertinent denazification. After the start of its independence, after they obtained the independence, Ukraine started looking for its identity, and it could not invent anything better than Putin ahead of anything else. You know, the fake, the false uh, heroes that collaborated with Hitler. I have already said that in early 19th century, the theorists of uh, a future prospective Ukrainian independence appeared. They assumed that an independent Ukraine should was to have a good relationship with Russia, but in the course of the historical development, and those territories were part of Poland, Ukrainians were persecuted, and this identity was pressed upon, the crackdown upon, and that all remained in, uh, in people's memory. And when World War II began, part of that far right or far nationalist elite began to collaborate with Hitler, thinking that Hitler would bring them freedom. And the German troops, the SS troops, did the filthiest part of the job to eliminate Poles and Jews, and they they did it with the hands of the collaborators, of those collaborators, and that massacre of the Poles and the Jews of Russians happened as a result. It was led by uh, Bandera, Shushkevich, and other characters well known. And those people are now presented as national heroes, and they kept telling everybody that, you know, nationalism is existent in other countries. There are sprouts, definitely, but, you know, they are trampled, trampled upon in many countries, not, but not in Ukraine. They're, in Ukraine, they are converted in national heroes. They're turned in national heroes, and monuments are erected to them. They are put on banners, and their names are chanted by the torch processions across the country. But those had annihilated, eliminated, exterminated Poles and Russians and Jews. And probably this glorification should come to an end. Any, any nation. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm telling, I'm saying that they're part of Russian people. They're saying that we're a separate nation. If they believe to be a separate nation, they have a right to think so. Not, all, however, building upon the Nazi ideology. Like, look at the French president. Would you be satisfied with the territory that you have now? Let me conclude the previous thought. You asked me about neo-Nazism and denazification. So, like the Ukrainian president came to visit Canada, it is well known, but it is hushed in, in the West, and they introduced a person to the Canadian Parliament, and that person, as the Speaker of the Canadian Parliament said, that this person waged warfare against Russians during World War II. 
And who were those who waged war against Russians? Hitler and his collaborators. And it turned out that he was part of the SS troops. He personally killed and slaughtered the Russians and the Poles. Uh, and the SS troops made out of Ukrainian nationalists did the dirty and filthy job. And the Ukrainian president rose together with the rest of Parliament of Canada. And he applauded this person. How can you imagine? How can you fancy that? And he, he is a Jew by the by, by ethnicity. Really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years. Nazi Germany no longer exists. <laughs> and so, true. And so, I think what you're saying is you want to extinguish or at least control Ukrainian nationalism. But how? How do you do that? Just listen to me. Your question is very intricate. May, may I think, my, uh, I think, speak up and say my true opinion? Will you not take offense? Of course. It is a tricky but a nasty question. You, you have been saying that Hitler is gone for 80 years. But actually his cause is with us, and uh, the people that exterminated Jews, Poles, and Russians are still alive, and uh, a, a president, the current president of, of today's Ukraine, gives this person a round of applause in Canadian Parliament, a standing ovation. Can we say that we eradicated this ideology altogether if we see such manifestations today? This is what I mean to be denazification. We should get rid of these people that Ha, ha, that bring this practice and theory to life, trying to preserve that. This is what denazification is about. Right. My question was a little more specific. It was, of course, not a defense of Nazis, neo or otherwise. It was a practical <coughs> question. You don't control the entire country. You don't control Kiev. You don't seem like you want to. So how, how do you eliminate <coughs> a culture or an ideology or feelings or a view of history in a country that you don't control, what do you do about that? Well, you know, strange as it may seem to you, during the talks in Istanbul, we did come to an agreement. And, you know, everything was put on paper uh, saying, uh, like statements that uh, no Nazism, neo-Nazism would be cultivated in Ukraine, that it would be prohibited at the legislative level. So we did come to an agreement on this subject. And this can be achieved through talks. And there's nothing humiliating in that to Ukraine as a modern civilized state. Does any country have the right to uh, propagate Nazism? No. That's it. Um, will there be talks, and why haven't there been talks about resolving the conflict in Ukraine, peace talks? Well, these talks did happen, and they did reach a very high point of uh, according our positions. Uh, it had been difficult, but these talks were almost finished, but once we withdrew our troops, troops from Kyiv, the other side, namely Ukraine, simply discarded all the agreements that had been achieved and uh, it ordered an agreement uh, following the orders of the U.S. and the Western countries to fight Russia until victory. Moreover, the Ukrainian president introduced a legislative ban on having negotiations with Russia. He signed a decree that bans anyone from having talks with Russia. How can they have talks if he prohibited himself from doing that and the rest as well? Yes, we do know that there are some ideas with regard to this settlement, but in order to uh, come to an agreement, you need to have dialogue, right? Well, but you wouldn't be speaking to the Ukrainian president, you'd be speaking to the American president. When was the last time you spoke to Joe Biden? Well, I, I don't remember. Well, we could look at, <laughs> look at this up. Well, why do I have to remember everything? You know, I've got many things to attend to. Well, he's funding the war that you're fighting, so I would think that would be memorable. 
Well, yes, he does fund that. When did that happen? The last time I spoke to him was before the beginning of the special military operation. Incidentally, I'm not going to go into details, but back then I told him, I said, I think you're making a history a mistake of historical proportions in supporting what is currently happening over there. I, I told him that, and I had said that to him on multiple occasions. What did he say? Well, you, you should ask him, please. It's easier for you, because you are a citizen of the U.S., you can go there and, you know, ask him. I think it would be wrong, improper for me. Since before February of 2022. No, we haven't spoken. We do have some contacts. Incidentally, you remember I told you about my proposal on working together on setting up a joint ABM system. Well, you can ask all of them, because all of them, luckily, are very uh, healthy and all alive, and the former president, and Count Elisa, and Mr. Gates, I think, and the current director of uh, CIA, Mr. Burns. Back then, he was ambassador to Russia, and I think he was very successful at what he was doing. And they were all witnesses to these conversations. You can ask them. And if you're interested in uh, to, to know what President Biden uh, responded to uh, uh, my words, you should ask him. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested, but from the outside, it seems like this could devolve or evolve into something that brings the entire world into conflict and could um, initiate some, a nuclear launch. And so why don't you just call Biden and say, let's work this out? Uh, solve this how, solve what? Because everything actually is very simple. We've got contacts at the level of different agencies. And, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you what we're trying to, uh, what kinds of signals we are uh, sending to them. And I, uh, w what we are saying is, if you want this over, you have to stop uh, the supplies of weaponry and everything is going to end in uh, several weeks and then we can uh, agree on the terms. It's as easy as that. So uh, no need to call for that. And, and what message well, asking them for, for, for that, for, for what? Because, uh, yes, uh, they are going to supply this and this weaponry to Ukraine, uh, and well, we're not afraid, okay, do that. Do you think NATO is worried about this becoming a global <clears throat> war or a nuclear conflict? Well, uh, Anyway, they're talking about that, and they're trying to intimidate their own population using an alleged, uh, made-up Russian threat. And still, thinking people and analysts, uh, those who work in politics, understand full well that this threat is uh, simply fabricated. They're trying to fuel the Russian threat. What you're referring to is a Russian invasion of Poland. Latvia, expansionist behavior. Is, can you imagine a scenario where you sent Russian troops to Poland? In only one case, if Poland decides, uh, if it invades Russia, because we have no interests in uh, Poland or in Latvia, so why do that? We have no interests. Only Threats. Well, the argument, I know you know this, is that, well, he invaded Ukraine, he has territorial aims across the continent, and you're saying unequivocally you don't. Absolutely. No. Uh, I rule this possibility out. You don't have to be an analyst because that goes against common sense, you know, to get involved in a global war. Because a global war would push humanity as a whole to the brink of uh, extinction. 
Yes, there are means of deterrence, that's true. You know, they were making threats saying that Russia would uh, use tactical nuclear weapons uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but these are, well, you know, it's just like a boogeyman for rank-and-file citizens to make uh, the U.S. taxpayers, the European taxpayers, uh, you know, to uh, pay up for military action in Ukraine, and their goal is to weaken Russia as uh, fully as possible. One of uh, our senior United States senators from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer, said yesterday, I believe, that we have to continue to fund the Ukrainian effort <coughs> or U.S. soldiers, citizens, could wind up fighting there. How do you assess that? I think it's provocation, and a cheap one to put. I don't understand why American soldiers would have to fight. You know, there are mercenaries from the U.S. in Ukraine. Uh, the biggest number from mercenaries comes from Poland and then the U.S. If uh, someone wants to dispatch regular troops to Ukraine, then that would, no doubt, put humanity on the brink of a very serious global conflict. Does the U.S. need that? Why? Now, fight someone uh, thousands of kilometers from your national territory. Don't you have other things to look into? I think there are issues on the border, issues with migration, with external public debt, you know, like to the tune of more than 30 trillion U.S. dollars. There are other things to do. Isn't it better to come to an agreement with Russia? Uh, given the current developments, given that you understand that Russia is going to fight for its national interests until the very end. So this should compel us to get back to common sense, to have respect for our country, for our interests, and to search for solutions. I think this would be far smarter and far more sensible. Who blew up Nord Stream? You did. I was busy that day. <laughs> Nate, it, do you have, do you have, uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, thank you, though. Well, personally, you might have an alibi, but CIA doesn't have one. Do, do you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? Well, you know, I'm not going to go into detail, but as they say, you know, you've got to uh, search for someone who had interest in that. And in this particular case, you don't have, uh, you have to search not just for someone who is interested in that, but also uh, someone who has the capabilities, because there are many people who are interested in that, but, you know, not everyone is capable of uh, scouring the air. Uh, bottom of the Baltic Sea. But I'm confused. I mean, that's the biggest act of industrial <coughs> terrorism ever, and it's the largest emission of CO2 in, in history. Okay, so if you had evidence, and presumably given your security services, your intel services, you would, that NATO, the US, CIA, the West did this, why wouldn't you present it and win a propaganda victory? <laughs> Well, it's very difficult, you know, to achieve a propaganda victory because the U.S. controls all the global media. And as far as many Europeans, uh, European media are concerned, the end beneficiary in many cases are American uh, funds, foundations. So, you know, so, you know getting mired in that, well, this is one avenue to pursue, but, you know, it can uh, turn out to be very expensive. And moreover, we might reveal our own sources of information without securing the end result. The whole world understands what happened, and even the American analysts uh, speak yes, about that publicly. I, but, but here's a question you may be able to answer. You worked in Germany, famously. Um, the Germans clearly know that their NATO partner did this, but they, and it damaged their economy greatly, it may never recover. Why are they being silent about it? That's very confusing to me. Why wouldn't the Germans say something about it? 
Ну, меня это тоже удивляет. Well, I am as confused as you are, but the current German leadership is not guided by national interests. What it's guided by is the interests of the collective West. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to explain the rationale for their action or omission to act. Well, yes, Nord Stream 1 was uh, blown up, uh, Nord Stream 2 has been damaged, but one of the strings is still very much alive, and you can get gas uh, through this uh, line, but they're not uh, getting that. We are willing to do that, but they're not asking for that. There is another route via Poland, and uh, Poland has shut that down. But uh, Poland is uh, eating from the hands of uh, Germans. They're taking money from the European funds, whereas the biggest donor to those funds is uh, Germany. But uh, Poland has shut down the pipeline leading to Germany. Why did they do that? I do not understand. Or well, let's uh, have a look at Ukraine. Germany is uh, the second biggest donor after the US in terms of financial aid uh, provided to Ukraine. Through Ukraine, there are two gas pipelines. So why wouldn't they take one of the uh, gas pipelines? They could ask uh, Ukraine to open uh, that up, and they would get gas from uh, Russia. So uh, the Germans are giving them money, giving them weapons, uh, so they could ask for gas from Russia in response, because otherwise they have to pay triple price for LNG. And it uh, brings down the competitiveness uh, of the German economy. And they, they've given money to Ukraine, and uh, they could ask uh, in recompense, you know, to for, for some economic support, like gas. So you should ask them why they're doing what they're doing. These are incompetent people. Well, maybe the world is breaking into two hemispheres one with cheap energy, the other without. And I want to ask you that. If, if we're now a multipolar world, obviously we are. Can you describe the blocks of alliances? Who, who is in each side, do you think? Well, you are saying the world is being split into two hemispheres. It's our brain that it's divided into hemispheres. One hemisphere is responsible for one uh, field of action, uh, the other is more creative, but still it's one brain, it's one head, and the world should be one, should be united, security should be together, should be common, shared. Uh, it shouldn't be security just for the golden billion. And only if it's uh, one world, then the world is going to be predictable and stable. And as long as the head is split into two, it's a disease and a grave one, too. And right now the world is suffering from this grave disease. But I think, uh, to a large extent, thanks to uh, sincere and uh, honest journalism, we will be able to overcome that disease. Well, let's just give one example, the, the US dollar, which has kind of united the world. Uh, in a lot of ways, maybe not to your advantage, but certainly to ours. <coughs> Is that going away as the reserve currency, the, the, common, the universally accepted currency? How have sanctions, do you think, changed the dollar's place in the world? Well, you know, I think this is one of the uh, uh, gravest uh, strategic mistakes uh, committed by the U.S. leadership, you know, using the U.S. dollar as an instrument for foreign uh, political uh, confrontation because dollar was the cornerstone of American prosperity and power, and everyone understands and understood that because however many dollars you've printed, they go around the world, inflation is at a minimum, I don't know, 3% or so, 4%, which is an acceptable level for the US. And you can print as many US dollars as you like. Uh, you know, because uh, the public debt of the US is testimony to that. But be that as it may, dollar is still the cornerstone of American power across the world. But once the US leadership decided to use the US dollar as an instrument for foreign policy confrontation, once they did that, they dealt a blow to the American power. 
I would be loath to, you know, uh, use uh, for uh, better words uh, that, are, uh, that are improper, but uh, it is a very grave mistake. Look, uh, even the American allies uh, do decrease their dollar reserves. They are starting to search for ways to shield themselves because if the U.S. applies restrictive measures to certain countries, such as, uh, you know, uh, freezing assets or restrictions on uh, transactions, then it is a very grave uh, signal to the whole world. What did happen in Russia? Until 2022, around 80% 80% of uh, Russian foreign trade transactions were carried out in U.S. dollars. And uh, U.S. dollar accounted for about 50% of our transactions with third countries. Whereas currently this figure has been brought down to 13% or so. But we were not the ones to prohibit the use of U.S. dollars. This was not our goal. It was the U.S. decision to restrict uh, our transactions in dollars, which is absurd, especially from the point of view of the interests of the U.S. taxpayers, because this decision has dealt a blow to the American economy, undermining the American power across the world. Incidentally, our transactions in yuan accounted just for 3%, right now uh, we've uh, gone up to 30% in transactions in uh, rubles and 34% in yuan, in renminbi. So why did the U.S. do that? I think uh, it's self-conceit. They thought that the Russian economy would collapse, but it didn't. <coughs> Moreover, look at the other oil developing, uh, oil uh, producing countries. They are doing the same thing. They are following our suit. They start to pay for oil in renminbi. Do they understand what they're doing in the US? What are they doing? You know, it's like. Uh, uh, undermine their, their own prosperity. Ask anyone uh, who is a thinking person in the U.S. I think, that's a fa I, I think that's a fair assessment. The question is what comes next, and maybe you trade one colonial power for another much less sentimental and forgiving colonial power. I mean, are, is the, the, the BRICS, for example, in danger of being completely dominated by the Chinese, the Chinese economy uh, in a way that's not good for their sovereignty? Do you worry about that? <laughs> you know, these uh, spooky stories, we've heard them before, bogeyman stories. China and us are neighbors. And, you know, you cannot choose neighbors or relatives. We share a border with them, 1,000 kilometers. This is number one. Number two, we're used to one another. We've been around for centuries. In terms of our coexistence, third, the foreign affairs philosophy of China is not aggressive. Their main tenets are about uh, searching for compromise, for a trade-off, and we can see that. And uh, the next point is as follows, and I try to lay it out mildly in my language, where I said that the volume of cooperation and trade with China keeps growing, while the pace of the growth of China's cooperation with Europe is higher, outpacing. Uh, the cooperation with Russia. Just ask the Europeans, are, are they not afraid of uh, being exposed to China? They might be, but you know, anyway, they want to enter the Chinese market when they face the economic issues now, they're facing economic issues now, and the Chinese enterprises and companies are tapping into the European market. And there are a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs and businesses in the US. Well, uh, the policies are to the effect of confining 
They are damaging themselves, actually. Trying to confine, limit cooperation with China, you are damaging your economy. This is a very intricate matter. There can be no silver bullet solutions as uh, also regards the dollar. Well, with respect to the legitimate from the perspective of the Uncharted sanctions, one should have a second thought whether to make such decisions or not. So you said a moment ago that the world would be a lot better if it weren't broken into competing alliances, if there was cooperation globally. One of the reasons you don't have that is because the current American administration is dead set against you. Do you think if there were a new administration after Joe Biden that you would be able to reestablish communication with the U.S. government? Or does it not matter who the president is? Let me finish the previous uh, thought. We have 200 million, billion dollars. This is the uh, target of uh, myself and my friend, uh, that of my friends, Xi Jinping, the, the president of China. We want to reach $200 billion of mutual trade, and we have smashed that. We have exceeded that. We have around $230 billion of, of bilateral trade, and the Chinese statistics say that it's around $140 billion. And, uh, what is important is that it is a well-balanced uh, type of mutual trade, mutually, mutually complementary in energy and uh, scientific solutions and technological solutions and other things. It's well-balanced in an equilibrium. With respect to BRICS, by and large, Russia has assumed the presidency there since the start of the year. And, you know, BRICS countries are powerhouse economies rapidly developing. Oh, I hope my memory wouldn't uh, let me down. In 1992, the G7 countries' proportion global economy equaled around 47%. In 1992, in 2022, it slumped down to 30-something percent, while the BRICS share was 16% in 1992, and now it is in uh, excess of the G7 share in global economy, and that has nothing to do with the Ukrainian developments. The global trends manifest themselves in this way. This is inevitable. This will keep happening. It's like the rise of the sun. You cannot prevent the sun from rising. You have to accommodate and adjust the United States. How does the United States accommodate that? With help of force, sanctions, pressure, bombings, armed forces applied everywhere. This is about conceit. Your political elite does not understand that the world has been changing and it is an objective process, a natural process, and you have to make proper decisions, timely decisions to preserve its uh, level of dominance and such gross actions would lead to the opposite results. This is obvious today. You've just asked me whether another administration in the U.S. would change things. It's not about the leader, the personality or administration. I had a very good relationship with George Bush. And I know that in, in, stay, in the United States, he is treated as a simple countryside guy that has little idea of things, but it's not true. And with respect to Russia, he did a lot of mistakes also. I told you about the Bucharest summit of NATO in 08 to open doors to Ukraine. But you know, it was under Bush, and he put pressure on the Europeans. But actually, I had a good personal relationship with them, interpersonal. And it was no worse than any other American or Russian or European politician. He knew what he was doing as well as other people. I had a good relationship with uh, Donald Trump. It's not about the personality of the leader. It's about the sentiment of the elites. If the American society has the prevalence of um, domination at all costs, 
with uh, the help of resorting to force, things will deteriorate, keep deteriorating. But if they come to a conclusion, they come to infer that the world is changing and it is a natural process that cannot be um, helped, they have to adjust themselves using the advantage that the American uh, nation still has. In this case, something will change for the better. The Chinese economy has become number one by PPP. They have outpaced the US in volumes. And then uh, there is India, 1.5 billion people living there. And then comes Japan, f uh, fourth, and Russia is fifth global largest economy. Uh, last year, it became the largest economy in Europe, despite all the restrictions and sanctions. Do you think it is natural? A lot of sanctions are exerted against us. We have been disconnected from SWIFT transaction system, and sh our ships are under sanctions, are uh, vessels, oil-carrying vessels, and uh, aircraft of ours. The biggest number of sanctions in the world is applied against this country, and we have become the biggest economy of Europe over that period of time. The instruments and the policies of the United States are ineffective. So they should think what to do. If they come to, to understand that, I mean, the elites, the ruling classes, things will improve, and, and the, the leader of the country will probably act in the interests of the voters and the decision makers at different levels. But you're, you're describing two different systems. You say the, the leader acts in the interest of the voters, but you also say these decisions are not made by the leader, they're made by the ruling classes. <coughs> You've run this country for so long, you have known all these American presidents. What are those power centers in the United States, do you think? Like who actually makes the decisions? I don't know. America is a very complex system. On the one hand, it's conservative. On the other hand, it is. It has been changing rapidly, and it is uh, hard to have an idea, an exact idea of what is happening. And each state has its own legislation. Each state has its own regulation, and they can bar people from candidates from elections, and they have the two-stage, two-tier electoral system. It is very hard to to, to know it, for, to know it uh, quite well. There are two main parties, dominating parties, the bipartisan system, and, you know, there is the decision-making center. But anyway, look, uh, after the collapse of the USSR, there was an erroneous, unfounded policy against Russia, the policy of pressure. Uh, NATO expansion means pressure and the backing of separatists in the Caucasus and the ABM, the Missile Defense System establishment, is also about pressure. Then um, Ukraine was dragged into NATO. It is also an element of pressure. Why so? Because excessive production capabilities were created. Lots of think tanks and centers and Soviet studies professionals that knew no other thing, and they persuaded the political leadership that they should keep pressing Russia, mounting pressure to partition Russia uh, with several quasi uh, states on its territory so that the aggregate potential and capability would be used for further struggle with China. This is a mistake. Um, because there have been too too many too many professionals uh, dealing with the opposition to the USSR. Probably there there is need for new, fresh blood and forces and people that are forward looking and know what is happening worldwide. Look at Indonesia, six hundred million people, a huge population. Uh, that you have, that you cannot turn a, a, a blind eye upon, and Indonesia is now entering the club of the leading economies, and despite all economic problems, the U.S. has a good economic situation, and the growth rate is around 2.5 percent, if I'm not mistaken, but actually 
If you want to provide for a, a good future, you have to change the approach to what has been happening. The world will, will anyway change, irrespective of what is the outcome of the Ukrainian situation. The world has been changing, and, uh, you know, the pundits and experts in the U.S. start writing that gradually the United States changes its policies to the world, but whether it's uh, abrupt, quick and painful or smooth and gradual, this is the question. And this, these are the, the ideas of people that are not anti-American in nature, that just they are looking and tracking the global developments. And you know, we need uh, to have more forward-looking people that can analyze things and recommend uh, something to the political leadership. I just have to ask, you've said clearly that NATO expansion <coughs> eastward is a violation of the promise you all were made in 1990. <coughs> it, it's a threat to your country. Right before you sent troops into Ukraine, the Vice President of the United States went to the Munich Security Conference and encouraged the President of Ukraine to join NATO. Do you think that was an effort to provoke you into military action? Well, we repeatedly, on many occasions, suggested that decisions to the problems that emerged in Ukraine after the coup in 2014 should be found with peaceful means, but no one listened to us. But the Ukrainian leadership that was under the Ukrainian, uh, the American control stated all of a sudden that they would not honor the Minsk arrangements. They didn't like a thing about that, and they kept waging warfare in that territory. And the NATO military structures, you know, tapped into the Ukrainian soil with training centers and military bases established under these guys. And in Ukraine, they proclaimed that the Russians are not an original uh, nation, not an authentic nation, and they enacted laws that would limit the rights of the uh, ethnic Russian and Russian speakers. Ukraine received the Southeast as a gift from Russia, but all of a sudden they stated that Russians were not an authentic ethnicity there. In their totality, all these things brought about uh, the desire to stop the war launched by the neo-Nazis in 2014 in Ukraine with, you, the, with the use of force. Do you think Zelensky has the freedom to negotiate a settlement <clears throat> to this conflict? I do not know the details. I can hardly judge, but I probably think he, he, he has. Well, he father uh, was at war against the Nazis in the Second World War. I spoke with him uh, once about that. I told him, Vladimir, why are you supporting the neo-Nazi in Ukraine today when your father uh, fought them? He was the front line. I would, uh, soldier, I would not respond what he, uh, wouldn't say what he responded. It would be inappropriate. But, you know, with, the, with respect to liberty and freedom, well, of his, he rose to power. On the, well, uh, with the help of the Ukrainian expectations that he would bring peace to Ukraine. This is why he had a landslide victory. But when he rose to power, he figured that probably it would uh, be better not to quarrel with the neo-Nazis and nationalists because they are aggressive. And you can expect anything, they are loose cannon. And the second point is that the West will keep supporting those who are against Russia always because it's beneficial. So this is why he adopted this position, despite the previous uh, promises and pledges to his people to stop the war in Ukraine. So he deceived his own voters. But do you think at this point, as of February 2024, he has the latitude, the freedom, to speak with you or your government directly about putting an end to this, which clearly isn't helping his country or the world? Can he do that, do you think? 
Why not? Well, he believes himself to be head of state. He won the election, although we believe that all those things that happened after 2014 uh, originated from the coup d'etat. And today's authorities are flawed, deficient, and, you know, he believes himself uh, to be president and the, the United States and Europe recognize him and acknowledge his status. Well, we had talks with Ukraine in Istanbul and we nearly came to terms and he knew about that. And Mr. Rahami, who led the negotiating team of Ukraine, still is head of Ukraine's ruling party faction in, in, in the parliament, so he still is head of that uh, presidential faction. So he's still a, an MP and he subscribed the preliminary uh, instrument in Istanbul. And publicly later he said that we were ready to sign it, but uh, Mr. Johnson, the then Prime Minister of the UK, came and dissuaded us to do so, saying that better go to war with Russia and we, they would give us anything and everything so that we would return all the lands were lost, he said. And and they agreed, uh, he said, his statement was made public, he said it publicly and openly. Can they come back to that or not? Do they want it or not? And afterwards, the Ukrainian president issued a decree prohibiting to to negotiate with us, let him let him strike it down, let him repeal that decree. Whether Russia is ready, we hear these questions, but we do not decline to talk, let him abandon and repeal this decree. And the fact that they obeyed the um, persuasion of the former UK Prime Minister Johnson is ridiculous and very sad, I think, altogether. As Mr. Arahamia said a year and a half ago, we could stop the warfare, but actually the British persuaded us not to do so, and we, and we turned it down. Where is Mr. Johnson now? And the war is ongoing. That's a good question. Where do you think he is, and why did he do that? Hell knows. This was a mainstream idea. Everybody had, was delusioned that Russia could be defeated at the battlefield. This was about uh, self-assurance, con conceit, and uh, uh, very few reason, very little reason. This was uh, with uh, with uh, with the whole heart, but with little reasoning. You've described uh, the connection between Russia and Ukraine. You've described Russia itself a couple of times as orthodox. That's central to your understanding of Russia. You've said you're orthodox. What does that mean in, for you? You're a Christian leader by your own description. So what effect does that have on you? Well, you know, as I mentioned previously, in 988, Prince uh, Vladimir underwent baptism as his uh, grandmother Olga had done and then his armed troops also got converted and then other Russians converted into Orthodox Christianity. It took some time and then it uh, put some roots very deep roots in the minds of Russian people. When Russia expanded, taking in other nations and peoples, uh, professing Judaism, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Russia was always very loyal to those who followed other religions. And this was the source of Russia's power. There's no doubt about that. All world religions I have mentioned and which are also traditional religions of the Russian Federation have uh, almost the same precepts. The values in these world religions are very close, if not identical. And the Russian authorities have always 
cherished the uh, culture and the religions of uh, peoples admitted into the fold of the Russian state, which uh, served as the cornerstone of security and stability of the Russian nation, of the Russian people, because all peoples, almost all peoples living here, view Russia as uh, their motherland. Say, so if uh, there are people coming to the US from Latin America or there are migrants coming to Europe, very often they come from their historical land to you, to European countries. Whereas uh, those who uh, profess other religions than Orthodox Christianity in Russia still view Russia as their motherland. We are all one big family, and our traditional values are very close. I said this is one big family, but each family uh, also includes other smaller families, and this is the basic foundation of our society. And if uh, the family has tight-knit connections, then that is exactly the case, because you cannot assure a normal future for your children unless you ensure a normal future for the whole country. But can, I, can I say that the, the one way in which the religions are different is that Christianity is specifically a nonviolent religion. Jesus says, turn the other cheek, don't kill. How can a leader who has to kill of any country how can a leader be a Christian? How do you reconcile that to yourself? Well, it's easier to reconcile if you need to protect yourself, your family, your country. We have not attacked anyone. What was the starting point of the developments in Ukraine? The starting point was the coup d'etat as well as the uh, flare-up of violence in Donbass. And we are protecting ourselves, our people, our country, and our future. As far as religion in general is concerned, the thing is it does not manifest uh, mostly externally. It's not just about going to church every day and kneeling to the ground. Religion resides within your heart. This is our culture. It's very human-oriented. You know, Dostoevsky is very well known in the West as a genius of the Russian culture and the Russian literature. And he spoke about that a lot. He spoke about the Russian soul. The thing is, Western society is more pragmatic, whereas a Russian person, a Russian is uh, more concerned about eternal things, moral things, uh, values. Maybe you'll disagree with me, but I think Western culture is more pragmatic. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. This is what gives the golden billion uh, the uh, chance to uh, show some very good achievements in practical terms, in science. The thing is, we look the same, but our conscience, our mindset are somewhat different. Well, so, so do you see the supernatural at work as you look out across what's happening in the world now? Do you see God at work? Do you ever think to yourself, these are forces that are not human? No, honestly, I don't think that. I think the world community is uh, developing following the inherent laws, and these laws are what they are, and there's no escaping that. It was always like that in uh, mankind's history. Some countries rose, some peoples uh, got bigger, got stronger, and then they left the international stage, losing the quality they had been accustomed to. Well, let's look at Genghis Khan or the Golden Horde and the Conquerors or let's remember the Roman Empire. You know, uh, you might think that there was nothing greater than Ro Roman history and uh, uh, the history of mankind, but then the barbarians got stronger, got more numerous, and Rome fell. They had a head start, their economy started to grow stronger, and the regime imposed by the Roman Empire 
fell apart, but it took five centuries. The Roman Empire had been disintegrating for five centuries. The difference from the current state of affairs consists in the fact that right now the developments are far more rapid than they used to be during the Roman times. So when does the AI empire start, do you think? <laughs> you are asking increasingly more complicated questions. In order to respond to this question, you would need to be an expert in big numbers, uh, in big data, I mean AI. The thing is, humanity is facing a lot of threats uh, in uh, terms of genetics, for instance, because right now geneticists can go as far as to you know, create a specialized human being like an athlete or a genetically engineered military man. What do you think you know, of that? And a chip has been incorporated into the brain by Elon Musk. Well, I think uh, there's no stopping Elon Musk. He's going to do what he thinks he needs to do. But you need, to, I don't know, to uh, find some common ground with him. You have to search for ways to persuade him. I think he's a smart person, and you've got to, you know, come to an agreement, come to terms with him. This process needs to be formalized and subjected to certain rules. Humanity has to give some thought to what's going to happen to humanity due to the uh, new developments in genetics or in AI. You can forecast what's going to happen in a more or less accurate fashion. But once humanity felt an existential threat coming from nuclear weapons, back then all countries who possess such weapons uh, decided to come to terms with one another because they understood that nuclear weaponry could drive humanity to extinction. So once an understanding comes that unbridled development of AI or genetics or other fields, which cannot be stemmed, you know, you, you can't stop them. Research is going to continue as it was impossible to, you know, prevent powder from being used. And once humanity understands that this, the threat comes from these fields, then the time will come to come to an agreement on an interstate basis, intergovernmental basis, on how to regulate these fields. I, I appreciate all the time uh, you've given us. I just got to ask you one last question, and that's about someone who's very famous in the United States, probably not here, Evan Gershkovitz, who's the Wall Street Journal reporter. He's 32, um, and he's been in prison for almost a year. Uh, this is a huge story in the United States, and I just want to ask you directly, without getting into the details of it or your version of what happened, if as a sign of your decency, you would be willing to release him to us and we'll bring him back to the United States. Well, we've done so many gestures of goodwill out of decency that I think we've run out of them. Because uh, we've never uh, seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. But on the whole, we are willing to talk. We do not rule out that we can do that if there is a movement to accommodate us on the other side. And when I talk about the partners, I'm talking about our special services, and the special services are in contact with one another. They are talking about this subject. There is no taboo on uh, discussing this issue. It can be solved, and we're willing to solve it. But there are certain terms that need to be met there by discussed via special services channels. I think an agreement can be reached. So typically, I mean, this stuff has happened for obviously centuries. One country catches another spy within its borders. It trades it for a, one of its own intel guys in another country. I think what <coughs> makes, and it's not my business, but what makes this difference is the guy's obviously not a spy. He's a kid. 
and maybe he was breaking your law in some way, but he's not a super spy, and everybody knows that, and he's being held hostage in exchange, which is true. With respect, it's true, and everyone knows it's true. So maybe he's in a different category. Maybe it's not fair to ask for you know, somebody else in exchange for letting him out. Maybe it degrades Russia to do that. Well, you can uh, give different interpretations to what constitutes a spy, but there are some uh, things under law. If a person gets some secret information, does that confidentially, then that is qualified as espionage. And that is precisely what he was doing. He was receiving some confidential information. He's uh, getting that information in secret. Maybe he'd been uh, implicated in that. Maybe he did that out of his own volition or due to carelessness. But as fa facts stand, this is qualified under law as espionage. And he was caught red-handed when he was receiving that information and it's been proven so you know if it had been some far-fetched excuse something some fabrication then it would have been a different story but he was caught red-handed when he was getting in secret some confidential information but are you suggesting that he was working for the US government or NATO or he was just a reporter who was given material he wasn't supposed to have those seem like very different very different things. I don't know who was, uh, he was working for, but I would like to reiterate that getting confidential information in secret is called espionage. Maybe he might have uh, worked under the banner of the American Special Services. I don't think he was working for Monaco, even though Monaco might be interested in getting that information. But it's up uh, to the special services to come to an agreement. And some groundwork has been laid. There are people who, in our view, are not uh, tied to special services. You know, there is uh, a person uh, serving a sentence uh, in an ally country, well, uh, in a country that is an ally of the US, and that person, due to patriotic sentiment, uh, eliminated some bandits in one of the European capitals. During uh, the developments of the Caucasus, do you know what he was doing? I don't want to say that, but I'll do that anyway. He was laying our soldiers taken prisoner on the road, and then he uh, drove uh, his car over their heads. What kind of a person is that? Do you think that's a human being? And, um, you know, a patriot decided to eliminate that beast in one of the European countries. He did that on his own volition. Or not? Well, that is a different question. Yeah, but Evan Gershkovitz did that. I mean, that's a completely different... I mean. I mean, this is a 32-year-old like, newspaper reporter. He, he is not just a journalist. He is a journalist who was getting confidential information in secret. Yes, that's different. But still, I'm telling you about other people who are basically controlled by the US authorities, whatever they are serving a prison sentence. and. There is an ongoing dialogue among the special services, and this has to be done in a calm, responsible, professional manner. The contacts are ongoing, so let them do their work. I do not rule out that the person you've uh, referred to can go back to his country, Mr. Gershkovich. Moreover, it would be senseless to uh, keep him in prison in Russia. But we want our counterparts. The special services in the U.S. should also think about uh, helping our special services in achieving their goals. So we are willing to talk. Moreover, these talks are continuing. And there were many successful examples of these talks crowned with success. And maybe this is going to be crowned with success as well. But we have to come to an agreement. I hope you let them out. Mr. President, thank you. Well, I would also want him to go home, and I'm absolutely sincere with you. But let me say once again, the dialogue 
continuous. The more public we render things of this nature, the more difficult it becomes to resolve them. I wonder if that's I wonder if that's true with the, with the war, though. Also, I mean, I just want to. I guess I want to ask one more question, which is, and maybe you don't want to say so for strategic reasons, but are you worried that what's happening in Ukraine could lead to something much larger and much more horrible? And how motivated are you just to call the U.S. government and say, "Let's come to terms"? Well, listen, I think I said that. We do not refuse to talk, to negotiate. We're willing to do that. It's the Western side, you know, and Ukraine is a satellite uh, country for the U.S. It's evident. You know, I don't want to, uh, you to take that as a swear word, no. We understand that that is what is happening, you know, the financial support is there, it's uh, enormous, uh, Germany is uh, following suit, dozens of billions of US dollars are fueled into Ukraine, there's a huge influx of arms, of weapons, so probably uh, you should tell the current Ukrainian leadership, well, let's stop, let's uh, sit at the negotiating table, uh, rescind this absurd decree. Sure, but you already said it. I didn't think you meant it as an insult because you already said correctly, it's been reported that Ukraine was prevented from negotiating a peace settlement by the former British Prime Minister acting on behalf of the Biden administration. So, of course, there are satellite. Big countries control small countries. That's not new. And that's why I asked about dealing directly with the Biden administration, which is making these decisions, not President Zelensky of Ukraine. Well, if uh, Zelensky administration in Ukraine refuses to talk, then I think uh, they've got uh, the instructions from Washington. That's what I assume. Well, uh, you should explain to Washington that this is not the right uh, pretext, they have to, you know, come up with uh, some explanation which is not going to uh, insult anyone. So it was not our decision, it was their decision, and it is up to them to rescind that decision, to go back on it. But they took the wrong decision. So uh, while we are the ones to uh, find out a way out, we don't need you know, to correct their mistakes. If it's their mistake, they have to correct it themselves. So I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't think that I am. I think you're saying you want a negotiated settlement to what's happening in Ukraine. <laughs> right, and we were there. There was a very huge document which we prepared in Istanbul, and it was initialed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation. He opposed his signature to the document, and we published some of the provisions. He put his signature, and he said they were willing to sign it, and the war would have been over 18 months ago, but Prime Minister Johnson came, and he dissuaded us, and we lost that, missed that chance. Yes, it's a mistake, but let them get back to that. It's as simple as that. Why do we need to bother ourselves and correct other, others' mistakes? Well, yes, uh, you can say that uh, this might have been our mistake that we have decided to escalate and use uh, weapons, uh, arms, you know, to, to put an end to the war that started back in 2014. But let me get you back further to history. I told you, let's get back to 1991, when a promise was given to us uh, not to expand NATO. Or let's get back to 2008, when the doors were open to NATO. Or let's Let's get back to the Ukrainian Declaration of Independence that proclaimed it as a neutral state. Or let's get back to the developments when uh, American and British bases started to be set up in Ukraine. Or let's get back to 2014, the coup d'etat, you know, but it's senseless. You, you can go back to history and go to and fro ad infinitum. Uh, it's a mistake, yes, but let them correct that, and we are willing to talk. Do you think it's too humiliating at this point for NATO to accept Russian control of what was two years ago Ukrainian territory? Well, I, I said that. 
Let them think how to uh, come out of this in a dignified manner. If uh, the will is there, up until now, there's been a lot of talk about the need to secure a strategic defeat on the battlefield against uh, Russia. Right now, they're coming to realize that it's impossible. I think it's impossible. It's never going to happen inherently. And I think uh, they're coming to realize that. I mean, those who control uh, powers in uh, the West, and once the realization has set in, they have to think about that, and we're willing to talk. Moreover, would you be willing to say, congratulations, NATO, you won, and just keep the situation where it is now? Well, this is a matter for talks for negotiation, and uh, no one is willing to talk about that with us. Well, maybe they want uh, talks, and I know they do want. It's not just I see that, I know the will is there, but they don't know how to uh, go about that. They've driven the situation to the point where we are at. And we're not the ones to have done that, it's our partners, our counterparts. Okay. It happened, but they have to think about how to reverse the situation. <laughs> but maybe we shouldn't say that on camera. <laughs> yeah, you know, it would be funny if it were not so sad. You know, and this incessant mobilization in Ukraine, the hysteria, you know, the uh, domestic problems they've been plunged into sooner or later will come to an agreement. I know it might sound bizarre in the current situation, but be that as it may, the relations between the two peoples will be rebuilt. It'll take a lot of time, but they will heal. And there are, you know, some examples. Well, to cite an example, the Ukrainian soldiers uh, were encircled. Uh, I'm just drawing this example from real life. Our soldiers were shouting to them, there's no chance, uh, uh, surrender yourselves and uh, you'll go out alive. And they are shouting, uh, speaking perfect Russians, uh, perfect Russians, saying Russians do not surrender, you know, from the Ukrainian. So what is happening currently to a certain extent is an element of civil war. And everyone in the West think that the hostilities have uh, driven a wedge into uh, these two nations splitting them apart forever. But it's not going to happen. They will get back together. Why are the Ukrainian authorities dismantling the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? Because it brings together not just the territory. It brings together our souls and hearts. And no one will be able to separate that soul. Shall we uh, end here, or is there anything else? No, I think that's great. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you.